Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for June 7th, 2018. I am once again joined by my lovely co hosts, Lincoln Damerst and W. Eric Martin. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, Scott. Lincoln. Also joining this week are Steph Hodge and Roddy Smith. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hey there. I guess I guess we're not also lovely, Steph. Aww. Apparently. <laughs> you have to earn it. Glad to be here. I gotta earn it, right. You gotta earn the lovely status. Aww. But uh, yeah, let's just say you're lovely. We'll just get that out of the way. And uh, <laughs> So we're back fresh from BGD Spring 2018. And uh, I think we had a great time. I had a great time. Uh, I'm going to toss it over to Rodney and Steph because they were uh, first timers. What did you guys think of the show? I thought it was amazing. I That library was awesome. I just couldn't believe how many games there were that I haven't played that I need to now play. <laughs> um, I got to learn, I think, 30-something games, and I played about 60, and it was nonstop gaming for me. I had so much fun. <laughs> I can't believe how many games Steph fits into convention. I felt like I had gained the most at BGG Spring that I had in a long time. And then when she told me her numbers, I was like, okay, what, what was I doing the whole time I was there? <laughs> but it was, it was a really fantastic. I've been to BGG uh, Con in the fall, but not to spring. And it's, it's, a, it's smaller, but it still retains that, that community feeling. I don't know how to describe it exactly. I think there's something special about the majority of the convention goers all being in the same space relatively. And looking up and going like, hey, here's everybody, and I'm just a part of this massive group of people all doing the same activity that we all are kind of bonkers for, which is, which is pretty cool. What were your totals, Rodney? Uh, do we have <laughs> to talk about it? It was like, I don't know, I think I played 10 different games, and then, you know, a couple of them more than once, but maybe 10. It's pretty I good. I played about 10 myself. Okay, I don't feel so bad. No. Well, I, I was with Steph, so maybe I played like 20. I probably played like 20. It's crazy. <laughs> You go diving in the library and you find lots of 15-minute games. You can knock those out. Yeah, there were a lot of Japanese ones in there that I really wanted to check out. So I'll have to make that a happening at in November. Right. We're actually bringing somewhere around 6,500 games to the convention now. Um, that's with some duplicates, so it's not unique titles. But uh, you can't play that in a lifetime, I don't think. It's, it's just uh, mind-boggling how many games there Steph are. Steph could. Challenge accepted. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's right. Well, the weird part, of course, is we're going to add a thousand more games before the November convention. I mean, again, not unique titles, but it'll be at least that many copies. Right. That being said, so that kind of transitions into something that we did for the first time this year, which was the uh, spring cleaning storage sale. So we brought 2,000 of the games that we've had in storage for a few years now to the convention, and we put them out on tables uh, a ballroom full of tables, probably like 50 tables, and we just let people come in and, and buy them. Um, technically, they're making a donation to the uh, Cafe Momentum, which is a charity here in Dallas that runs a restaurant that helps um, uh, youth offenders as they get out of jail to kind of change their environment. And it's a very positive, impactful to the community charity that I've recently come to know and love. Um, and we just dropped the, the cash donation off to them the other day, and they were just blown away. They thought they were getting something right around $5,000. I wanted to set the expectations low. I didn't know how much people were going to donate. We ended up raising $16,000, and uh, we took that over to their restaurant, and uh, they're going to put it to good use, I know. That is pretty amazing. I mean, there were a lot of games gone just in the first day. There were still great <laughs> games on the final day. There was just so much good stuff in the library that people don't even know about. Yeah, there were definitely some hidden gems from old times and, you know, some newer gems, too, that just kind of didn't really get played very much in the the current library. So we had to put them in storage. Uh, not saying there was any bad games in there. They were all good in some way. Um, <laughs> we even charitable. played some old uh, older titles while we were kind of sitting there waiting for the people to buy stuff. Uh, we got to play Mad Gab. <laughs> I got to play with that with Steph and Lincoln. And then we also played Compatibility, which is an older title, which you should check out. Uh, and potentially that should get a reprint, we think. That was actually a lot of fun. I can't believe how many things you and I were able to sync up on. It wasn't just at the end of the game, we had some struggles to get across the finish line. Yeah, some challenging topics came up near the end. The funny thing is, Steph, why don't you say how, how I matched up? I think Ron and I were like perfectly <laughs> compatible. Exactly. So like every time I'd flip a card, Ron would be perfectly matched with Scott. I was like, come on! <laughs> That's right. You, you learn a lot about people that way. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's right. He still went home with you, though. How many games did you take back with you from the storage that didn't sell? Zero. Wow, that's amazing. We took back nothing. There was a handful of games, maybe like about five tubs worth, so maybe like maybe about 100 games left over. Uh, and we just gave those out as extra prizes at the end of the show. So really, it's just a big win for everybody because some games that maybe weren't getting as much play time get to go to people who want to pick them up, and then you're also raising all this money for a great charity. It was a... I think people felt really good to be a part of that, honestly. You know, uh, at the end when you announced how much had been raised, I think everyone kind of felt like, hey, we all contributed to that in some way, which was really nice. Yeah, it was really heartwarming to see everybody kind of um, rise up and give a lot of money to this charity that I really like. And uh, I'm going to get more involved with them. We've uh, talked about doing some things. When we come back to downtown Dallas, uh, we'll be within a five-minute drive of the of the restaurant, so maybe we can organize something at the restaurant or... Who knows? We, we had some ideas and we'll uh, kind of flesh out over the next year. And this will be for the November convention? Right. So November 2019, when we go back to downtown Dallas. Right. That's right. We still have one more year at the Hyatt. That's right. November. Okay. Or are you looking ahead? We got to get through 2018, <laughs> then we'll be back down the, downtown in 2019. Some people have asked if spring is staying in the Hyatt Regency at DFW Airport, and the answer is yes, for the foreseeable future, we will be staying at that at that Hyatt. So spring will be at the Hyatt Regency DFW. Fall 2019 will start at the Hyatt Regency Reading Tower. So mark your calendars. Speaking of marking your calendars, in less than a week, we will be at the Origins Game Fair for 2018. We will be broadcasting live for five days starting Wednesday, June 13th. And it's it's a big schedule of games. We have a lot of openings still on Sunday. Sunday is completely empty right now. As we usually do, we'll go around the fair, we'll scout out, we'll see what we've missed is not on the schedule, and then we'll pull people in. And people will come up and ask to be on camera. Um, we end up pulling up people off the aisle as they're just walking around sometimes because our schedule is a lot looser at Origins. We just hang out and say hi, so come over and visit us. It's a really great event because we actually get to engage with the audience much more than we ever do at any other convention. We're always so busy and our heads are down in what we're doing. Uh, this one is much looser and nowhere near as time crunched as any of the other ones we do. I'm excited too because this is the first time that I'm going to be with you guys in the booth for, uh, for one of the days. Anyway, my, my schedule with you guys is a little lighter at this convention. At Gen Con, I'll be with you guys the whole time. but. But for Origins, it'll be, I think we're going to, Thursday, I think it is. I'm going to be spending the whole time in the booth there. Maybe shooting a few previews and, and just work in the booth and, and hanging out, which is going to be really great. Right. So come on by on Thursday if you want to meet Rodney. I'm sure you'll be uh, able to talk to people and, and uh, have some free time there to socialize. Speaking of, I have one more BGG announcement before we talk about game playing. Uh, I'd like to welcome Steph Hodge to the Board Game Geek team. She's on tonight, as you can see. And we're super excited to have her and her extensive game knowledges. Thank you, Aldi. That's awesome. I'm so excited to join the team. I can't wait to see what kind of media we can create together. It's going to be awesome. Yay, Steph. Yeah, really looking forward to it. You know, combined with Rodney, Eric, Lincoln, we're going to do some great stuff. I'm really excited that Steph's joining right as we're getting going with Rodney. So it's going to be great. We're going to have a lot of new shows. Uh, Eric has a couple new things he's working on. And hopefully we have some stuff that everybody's going to enjoy watching. So that's it for the BGD announcements this week. And now it's time for everybody's favorite segment. What have you been playing? I know we all played a ton of games at spring, uh, but let's keep it to a couple. Uh, Steph, why don't you start and talk about what you played that was really interesting to you at spring? Well, I was super excited that Eric had some Japanese games that he just brought in from Tokyo Game Market. So the one I was most excited to learn was um, Let's Make a Bus Route. Oh, does he have it? I have it right here. I'm ready. Yay! I played it again today with someone who was over visiting. Oh my gosh. So this game is a roll and write game, but you're really drawing a card and writing on a common map. Um, I don't know if Eric wants to show that too, but you're drawing on a common map and you're making your own bus route, trying not to cause traffic with other players. Um, and you're just trying to figure out the best way to collect all of the tourists and drop them off at the places they want to go. <laughs> That's right. Pick up the elderly people, commuters, all sorts of people. Take them where they need to go. So it plays so fast. We actually got to play it twice right before he had to leave. So that was excellent. Um, the other game that I got to try out was Dragon's Breath. Now, this is a new game from Haba, and it's it's just a kid's game. It's a dexterity game. You have a pile of gems in the center, and you're pulling off these rings. 
It's super simple, but it's so much fun. And the quality of the game is just awesome. I just love trying to get the right gems. All the gems. <laughs> we just played that for game night and it is so gorgeous. It just, the presentation is amazing. My only disappointment is it's just this standard Haba exterior box for the children's games where it's yellow. Obviously, that's something that they do so people can find their games, but it's not as amazing as it has inside the box. I totally agree. Even like the insert and the inside shell is amazingly beautiful. Yeah, great color. Really, really, really beautiful rendering. Those are my two favorites from the con. Well, I got to play Quacksalber von Quidlinburg, which I know everybody's excited about that we're talking here tonight. Eric's already put the box in the shot. I guess I could do the same thing. Hey, look, I got the box for once. Um, oh, jeez. But uh, not that that was, it was just the last thing we played. Um, it is such a great game. I was expecting it to be really neat when I saw the demonstration at Nuremberg, the little weird demonstration that we had. But wow, is it amazing. It's a... A bag builder that has a fantastic pressure look element and a lot of variability. Eric just put up a video uh, describing how to play it today, the day we're recording this, and it is worth a watch. Yeah, I really love the pusher lock element in this game because it presents you <laughs> with almost like the perfect lie <laughs> to yourself because you're drawing things out of the bag and you don't want to get bad things, but bad things will come out of the bag. You get too many bad things and you bust. But if you draw out the bad things early, you're watching everyone else drawing stuff out and they're going farther down the track and, and like I'm watching going like I have to keep drawing because if I if I don't I'm going to fall behind but that's a lie like I should just stop right there <laughs> take what I've got and keep going because if I bust I get nothing well not nothing but, but next to nothing anyway in comparison so it's it always tempts you to get back in the bag and do something stupid and I did that many a time when I played but even when things weren't going well in fact the gentleman to my left I think he busted like four out of the eight rounds at least and he came in second place. Like it was, you were never completely out of the game. And uh, whether you busted or not, it was always kind of fun and exciting. I, I really enjoyed it. Yes, I also enjoyed the Quacksalber. Or let me say it the right way. <laughs> the Quacksalber. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Better than I, I can say, say it, Scott. The right Quacksalber von Quidlinburg. The Quacksalber von Quidlinburg. Yeah, it was great. I It was super surprising, too, because I was expecting one of these games to not be great by uh, Wolfgang Varsh. Which I'm? How can this guy? He he signed his soul away to the devil. You no, know, <laughs> all the games he makes. <laughs> this year was amazing from him, and um, that's very rare for that to happen for me. Uh, to love everything someone puts out in a single year. Um, but yeah, I was in uh, one of those bad luck games. Um, I think at one point I had eighteen rat tails to to rat tails of ketchup mechanism uh, to help me, and I still couldn't come in first with the die rolling thing. But uh, anyway, I still love the game, even though it's got a quite a lucky um, luck aspect to it, which is, it's just fun. It's fun to draw the, the tiles, fun to play with the toys. Um, if you win, great, but if you don't, it's still fun. Maybe he'll come out with something at Spiel that you hate. There's still a chance. <laughs> There's still time left. That's right. <laughs> I, I know at the convention, I went back to my hotel room and just ordered it that night from Amazon.de. So I was, I, was, I was sold on it. I just think my family's going to love playing it. Yeah, I really love that game. Uh, the other game that I got to play was Cahoots from Mayday Games and J Designer J Treat. And it's a really cool, kind of a trick-taking game where you're only playing two cards per round. And you're trying to pair up with other players on the board. And only the suit that has the most points is going to win. And the neat trick about it is... Once you've played those cards, you now take cards, one card from the pool, and you burn the other. So four of those cards are going to go away, and then four of those cards are going to go back into the player's hands. And you're hoping that you can match them up so that you can win for that suit once again. Um, it's really neat. And, you know, of course you see people burning the cards that you would love because they're not interested in those suits. Each player has a card in front of them with three different suits that you're going to share in common with uh, two other players, I believe. Maybe all three. I don't remember. Uh, really, really cool. Okay. Scott, you play anything else aside from Quacksalber? Anything non-Steph related? Well, Steph was in the game I played of, of uh, this game, next game. that And Rodney, too. We all had a laugh. I mean, it was so fun. It is face cards designed by Leo Colavini, uh, in which you're basically making pairs of faces from either animals, people, or objects, and you're playing one face down in front of you. And, or, sorry, one face down to a central pot, and then one face up in front of you. Then all the... The cards in the center are shuffled and mixed, so you don't know who played what. Then you go around the table trying to figure out who matched with who made a pair with the other card. 
So if you look at my card and I've got something like a an orangutan face, and then maybe you'll figure out that it matches up with this wrestler guy who kind of has the same look on his face, like or sticking his tongue out or something. And you just say, oh, is that your pair? And I tell you yes or no. Uh, you, if I'm correct, or if you're correct guessing my pair, then you get a point and I get a point. If we match uh, across the, the different categories, such as like a person to an animal or a person to an object or whatever, then we get bonus points. Um, that being said, scoring is not the priority of this game. It's just the fun you'll have making funny, stupid pairs. Um, and then listening to what people explain how the pair matches when you're like, I can't believe you paired that with that. You know, that's the, that's the fun of the game. So it's a, truly a party game. Um, it's in its perfect length. You know, you go around the table two times, you're done. It's, it's really great. You had another face related game too on your list. You really dug one played with me. <laughs> yes, I have, so. uh, I don't know. There's something about this theme for me. Um, Emojito was a surprise and a delight. We played, uh, I played a couple different times. Played with um, One of my friend's uh, families came in, played with them. I played with Michelle's coworkers, and I also played with uh, our group here, um, with you, Eric, and stuff. And we, it's a game about making faces to express emotion. Um, and they have this great artwork where you just draw a card and you look at the animal or whatever. It's, it could be an object, too, like a pillow making a face, and then you emote that face or make a sound, um, and sometimes both, to the table, and then they try to pick which one you were. So you, as again, you throw a bunch of dummy cards into the mix. Everybody chooses which one you think thinks they, that you emoted, and then you, know, you score points. Um, yet again, another game where points don't really matter. The, uh, eventually, you, know, you just kind of play and uh, see if you can make the most fun face. So once we played the full game, we were actually interested in trying out a variant called Secret Messages, where you are emoting your face to somebody else who will then have to take your face and emote it to the next person in line. Um, and it was just amazing fun. I, I remember one round of that game where I started and I made the face of a scared sausage. And then um, I think I went to Ron and Ron made it angry sausage. So it went from scared to angry. And then I, so part of the rules are you're supposed to keep your eyes closed the whole time, no matter what. But we kept our eyes open, which I think is, it doesn't break the game, but it's super fun to watch each person pass the face around. So for me to Ron, it went angry and then it got angry and angry, angry. And then Eric was just like this super angry, like, you know, That's right. uh, pursed lips and everything. It was awesome. So I think, uh, I don't mess around that game. That variant just made it like it amped up the fun by 10. <laughs> angry sausage. <laughs> yes. What did you get to play, Eric? Uh, aside from being an angry sausage, uh, and some of the games we mentioned before, I got Nairobi, a game yeah. by Daniel Fair, coming from Lifestyle Board Games. Not even officially announced as being published, but we had filmed an overview in Nuremberg. They gave me a sample copy because I, I might have jumped up and down in the seat a little. And I finally played it a bunch at BGG Spring, uh, played 10 times now, and recorded an overview video that I'll publish once I'm get actual confirmation of the publication. And this is yet another cooperative game in which you're playing numbers in order. <laughs> so exciting. How many of them can there be? Yes. But the, the, the cool thing about this is you have numbers and some blank cards and you have commands for how you will swap these cards with other players at the table because you're trying to get the numbers that are face up on the table to be in numerical order, either clockwise or counterclockwise, ignoring the blanks. But those commands are going to be different every time you play. So one time the zero is going to say, swap it with the player to your left. And another time it'll say, swap it with an odd number. And another it'll say, swap it with weight. Or it'll say, can't be swapped. And so you don't know what the cards are going to be. You look at yours, you swap something, you look at the thing that you just got or that someone gave you, and now you learn a little bit more information. And then you learn a little bit more and you sort of start sneaking out with people and making plans for what to do. And we haven't tried an advanced game yet where you can't talk at all. That I cannot imagine. It, <laughs> it was difficult enough as it was. I remember when we were playing, because every time I go to a convention, I always look for Eric to teach me some obscure card game I have not heard of before. And this was definitely it. And, and it did not disappoint. But it was, you had played this a few times already, I could tell, because I'm staring at this circle of numbers and you're already like putting together, okay, we need to switch this one here and that one there. And I'm sitting there going like, no, this one can't move. It, this number will not move. Because I, you know, I know the secret commands under my own numbers. And it, it's interesting because it forces everyone to then go, well, if this can't move, 
we've got to come up with an entirely new way of doing it because it was going to be really easy and now it, it's not anymore. <laughs> and that's right. Other people, other people could take it from you if they have the right card to right. do so, but you don't necessarily know. And the rules spe specifically, we were, we were not doing hardcore rules where they say you're supposed to ask only yes or no questions. We, we were really being like a well, learning didn't, game. Didn't you and Steph have a game where you won it in four turns? Yes, we did. That was nearly continuous when we dealt it out. It ah. took almost no moves to make. And you're going to have a game like that. And then you'll probably have another game. We had another, uh, I know where the zero had to be swapped only with a lower number, which means it also can't move. In addition to the command that just says you can't switch this. Yeah, that was the time it was in front of me. And we were trying to puzzle out, where are we going to put this thing? How are we going to get out of here? And uh, That's yeah, right. it was really good. Someone rescue me. <laughs> It's like it's a stone around you and it's just dragging you down because then you have to swap the other things and you can't even swap that. And so you're just, I don't know, you're kind of hamstrung. If you can't make a move, you lose. I haven't seen that yet in 10 games, but maybe we could some point. <laughs> so in the game we played, I think we had almost the, the numbers going almost completely around one way. And then we figured we hit a dead end. And so we kind of inverted everything, which was kind of cool. But it took us near the like the 15 moves, you have like a time limit. Again, That's right, 20 24 moves. We, I think on 22, we finished it. That's right. Time. I consider it a success if it's just a victory at all, right? I mean, there's ratings. And, you know, <laughs> Rodney, I know you're excited about a few games. What did you play? Well, this is pretty uh, exciting and weird for me because normally on my YouTube channel, I don't review games at all, but I'm not on my channel, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> It's not a review, you're just chatting with friends. That's, That's all. right, caution to the wind. We're just talking about games. Well, the first game I want to talk about is Raja of the Ganges, which is by uh, Inca and Marcus Brand. And this was um, one I had heard some good things about, but had not had a chance to play until uh, BGG Spring. And my good friend Chaz Marler from Paradise Paradise kindly read the rules and taught it to me. And it's really an interesting game. It's set in, um, I don't know, 14th, 15th, one of the centuries, one of the centuries back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And everyone, everyone is a nobleman, and they've got their estate, and you've got your palace here, and you want to fill this estate up with tiles that you're going to buy from a supply. And these tiles will cost you dice pips. You have all these, all these uh, awesome dice, and the values that you collect in front of you can trade in to buy the properties you'll throw into your estate. But it's really a worker placement game. You've got, oh, I got a whole board here. I might as well show the board. I've gone so far already with this. So here's the board, and, and you're gonna be placing workers on this board. Now this is quite, when I first saw it, I was very concerned because it's, it's very busy. It's very beautiful, but very busy. Thankfully, once you get playing, it's, it's very straightforward. But you're basically uh, going to these different locations to acquire the dice that you're going to need to get those properties. And there's lots of places you can go to manipulate the dice values. I remember my first game, I, uh, I started with, everyone starts with four dice. I rolled them. I got all ones. That was exciting. <laughs> and then I got two more dice. I rolled those also, both ones. And then the next time I rolled, a one and a two, and I just was like, am I going to be sunk here? I was that guy at the table who was just moaning and groaning, and then eventually won the game. So there's <laughs> enough ways to manipulate the dice and use them in clever and interesting ways that I, I never felt that the, what you rolled was hampering you. What really came down to was where you put your workers, how you maximized the opportunities that you did have in front of you. And I've played it now with two players, three players, four players, and so far, everyone I've played it with has really enjoyed it at all player counts. So... I really enjoyed that one. Has any of you guys played that one yet? I know Steph must have. Oh, I have. This game is amazing. I love like not knowing where you're going to meet, but you're just trying to race to get to that meeting point and you're trying to collect all the money and get all the fame. And uh, I got to play the prototype last year and there was a little start player, which is now an elephant, but it was a little fuzzy hippo. So I was like, I want that fuzzy hippo. Oh my, oh my goodness, Steph. <laughs> you've, you've made it so apparent how terrible I am at teaching games. Because I didn't say the most coolest thing about the game, and you just, you just made reference to it. There's these two tracks that go around the outside edge of the board. One goes in one direction, one goes in the other, and you have markers on both. One's your, your wealth, and one's your fame. And it's when your markers meet, whenever they cross over, that triggers the end of the game. So it's not really so much that you are collecting points, so much as it's a race to either get a lot of fame and a little bit of money and enough to cross or vice versa or somewhere in the middle. And that's what triggers the game. And so it's really interesting because the first part of your game, you're kind of building up your engine, you're finding ways to get the points, and then eventually you just need to start cashing them in and erase your tokens around so they can cross. Really interesting game. That's interesting. Isn't there something like that in Heaven and Ale as well? 
Great question. That's the one game I didn't play at the show. Yeah, I, I did try Heaven and Ale at, at Spring, and it does, it has that, except you're moving things in the same direction. You've got a brewer who's going up, and you've got five resources, and you're moving all of them around a track, and at the end, you have to cash in all the resources that are the farthest ahead to try to push your brewer up and push your last resource, because at the end, you're going to multiply those whatever the wherever the brewer is with wherever that last resource is so ideally you want to move everything up as much as you can so that you can maximize that but of course it's not going to work out depending on the tiles you're getting what other people are doing and all that sort of stuff that's kind of like ganshin clever as well are you trying to push everything up all yeah. at the same time to maximize those foxes yeah i got one other game i want to tell you about as well this one uh is called crisis it's by Ludi Creations, and the designers are, uh oh, uh, Pantelis, Boobobulus, Soteris, and Synth. Okay, sorry guys, it's, they're great designers. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce their names. But this game was just kind of caught me by surprise. It's been around for a while. It was originally on Kickstarter, but I don't think they made enough to really push it out in a big way in retail. But I kept hearing good things about it from people who had played it, and they recently did another Kickstarter for a new edition with an expansion. And I believe that's, there's going to be more copies of that for it to go into retail, which I'm really happy to see because I've been really enjoying this game. Part of it's the theme. The theme of this game is that there is a country and it's just in economic decline. And so you are coming all in as plucky young entrepreneurs who are going to invest in businesses and try to make, um, you know, uh, lemonade out of lemons here. But the game, well, two things in the game that are kind of interesting about that is that one part's the engine building. So players are going to be investing in these companies. So I got an example of one right here, like this farm. Here's a little farm. It's going to invest in this company. And to get this going, it says you need an employee with a shovel. Well, that's no problem. I've got an employee with a <laughs> shovel right here. So that's all you need. Well, it's, one employee with a shovel. It, it, it's so a, no, this does not seem real. Look, yeah, it's, it's it does maybe, not seem realistic. Maybe this is the future. Okay, <laughs> shovels are all you need. <laughs> That's the right. carrots come pre-planted. I guess this is abstract. <laughs> That's right. And so you, you yeah. put your little guy in here, and now he's going to produce bread. Uh, that's also kind of weird, right? Bread's coming out of the ground with the shovel. I, I don't know. <laughs> Look, just stick with me here. <laughs> that, that's right. That's that's the shorthand version. That's that's the number two is the question mark, and step three is bread. That's right. There exactly you go. right. <laughs> but the cool thing is you got other employees. Down here on the, on the bottom of the track, there's other workers, uh, employees you can plug in here. Like if you have a hammer, <laughs> you can make your farm even better which makes a lot of sense. You can make more bread with this. So part of it is having to hire these employees and then figuring out how to plug them into the business that you invest in to make them better. What's the good of bread, you say? Well, one thing, you can do is sell the bread and make money with it, that's good. Or you can take the bread and use it here in your resort because there's nothing more people at a resort like to eat than bread. <laughs> <laughs> and this one also needs workers and other things you can plug in. This one will actually pump out money and victory points. So part of the fun is you never have quite enough employees generally. So you're trying to figure out where do I put them? As you get new business, you might start shuffling them around so you can maximize what you're doing to feed your other businesses. But here's the other kind of cool thing about the game. Here's, the, here's a part of the board. Here's a part of the board here. So you're going to be tracking the economic health of Axia on this line here. And over here, we've got kind of the, the scoreboard area. The game is going to say to you, hey, everybody, you players, you plucky entrepreneurs, you all need to get, in round one, you all need to get at least 18 victory points. And so the problem is you start at 15, and you think, well, that's not so bad. We can get a few more victory points. It's really tough to get victory points. And by the amount you fail by, the total economic decline of the country starts to go down. Whereas if you uh, ex exceed it, the, the country starts to do better and go up. The problem here is if you keep failing, eventually the economy crashes and the game just ends. And the people who did not meet the goals will just lose. So it's funny because there's ultimately going to be one winner generally, but you have to work together, kind of. I was playing a game and we realized the game's going to end. We're all going to lose. None of us are going to hit the goal. So we actually had to stop and look at what was on the, on the board. It's a worker placement game. And we had to decide, wait, you need to put your worker there. I want that thing. But if you don't get it, we're going to lose. So I'll give it to you this round. And so there's this sort of kind of cooperative thing where you're puzzle solving. How do we just keep the economy afloat so we don't all fail? But then at a certain point, once the economy starts getting a little better, immediately the knives come out. No, I want that space. I'm taking it. And it's, I don't know. It's just there's an interesting tension in the game because of that, that factor. So I'm, so far, the, the, the couple of times I've played it, it's been a big hit with people I've played it with. I'm looking forward to play, playing it more. Yeah, I backed that on Kickstarter the first time, and I, I've got it sitting here waiting to be played. I think I'm going to push it up 
the priority list after hearing you talk about it. it does sound really interesting. That's right. They had it at Spiel 2016. They sold the last copy there, and they're just like, okay, that's it. We're done. But yeah, apparently they were not done. Come back for more. Well, well find me at any convention. I'm, I'm bringing it with me any, everywhere now, and I'm always looking for people to play it with. So at Origins, I'll be there with it. If anyone's listening and sees me and like, hey, you want to play a game, I'll probably have it with me. I'll take you up on that. Okay, that was a lot of games we talked about. I think there was some great stuff to play. I have added th- some things to my list to play, so... Uh... Thanks, everybody, for sharing that information. Um, it's been kind of a light news week, um, but a couple things have crossed over into uh, interest. Uh, Steph, why don't you talk about the first one? Today, I saw a post that they might be republishing Gengopolis, if he can find a publisher to partner up with. So there is hope for a reprint for Gengopolis, and if you know me at all, this is my number one favorite game and I was fortunate enough to teach Aldi and Rodney how to play at BGG Spring. That was amazing. And what a good teacher it was. I've been hearing about this game for ages, it feels like. And it's really hard to track down a copy. I don't think you can, really, unless you're getting it secondhand somehow. And, uh, yeah, it was a really good good teach, Steph. Um, you did beat us, as I recall. I don't know if you crushed us, but it... Um, it was not yeah, a crushing. A and I think I only won by a couple points. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> I must have been thinking about Feast for Odin when you destroyed me. Yeah. Oh, that yes. That's right. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was really fun. It was, a, it was a really interesting, different kind of game. It wasn't like something I'd played before. Yeah, I had a great time playing it. It had passed me by when it first came out. I just didn't get a chance to play it. Um, and thanks for teaching it. I had a great time playing I'm glad it's going to maybe get a reprint. Me too. I'm maybe might turn into probably um, in this age of printing lots of games and and satisfying the markets that emerge. So I'm looking forward to seeing it reprinted and getting a copy. Eric, do you have some news about Cosmic Encounter? Yes, Peter Olaka was at a an event recently, this past week, and Fantasy Flight Games, while well, there, announced the 42nd anniversary edition of Cosmic Encounter, which is very much like their earlier 2008 edition of Cosmic Encounter, except with the addition of a demon race or demon species. Alien Species that was previously released only as a promotional item will now be included in the base game. They will also have some combinations of aliens that they suggest you play. You know, have six players, pick out one of these cards, and everyone take one of those roles because they will work well together in in different ways. They have revised rulebook, a new uh, comic book format, instructional manual, a quick start guide, in addition to their regular rulebooks. So it's mostly the same but a little jazzed up for 42 years of Cosmic Encounter. Yeah, Cosmic Encounter is one of my favorite games. I I really liked it. I haven't played it in a long time, so maybe I'll get the new version and and check it out again. I see that you've been backing a lot of Kickstarters. Not that that's unusual, but have you found anything cool in there? Yeah, so this week on Kickstarter, one of the games jumped out to me. It's called Villagers, and it is a card drafting game uh, and engine building game coming out of the U.K., uh, it's already got 7,500 backers and has raised $341,000. Uh, I'm not sure what the equivalent in Sterling is, but, uh, you know, less, but, um, it looked really interesting. The artwork is super minimalistic. Like it's got a very cool style. It almost kind of reminds me of a little bit of Quanchai's work. I'm not sure if Quanchai's working on this. I didn't check who the artist was, but check it out on Kickstarter. It's Villagers. And, um, it looks like it's just a real interesting drafting and build, village building game for one to five players. So that's got that solo game aspect. I think that's probably why it's getting pretty popular. A lot of solo games are doing well on Kickstarter these days. And its artwork is fantastic. That's cool to hear. So that wraps up another week on the Board Game Geek Show. Thank you again, everybody, for watching and subscribing. Remember, you can send us a question that we may read on the show to show at boardgamegeek.com. And I'd like to thank my lovely co-hosts, Lincoln, Eric, Steph, and Rodney for coming on this week. It's been awesome. We earned it, Steph. We're lovely. We got a lovely status. (laughs) (laughs) They finally earned it, I guess, huh? And you guys can come tell them in person at Origins. Right. Come visit us at Origins, and uh, we'll see you there. Yeah, we hope to see you there. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.